Welcome to Abraham's Legacy Lecture Series. First, I'd like to thank the power of the founder and the mover behind Abraham's Legacy, Ms. Orly Waba, for her remarkable efforts. May Hashem continue to give her the power and the strength to be able to continue her wonderful Avodos HaKodesh to bring great merits to the Jewish people in order to be able to rebuild the Holy Temple in our day. I'd also like to mention that this class is being given in memory of Avram ben Pauline, Halav HaShalom. We're living in difficult times, and there are two difficult times that I'm referring to. Difficult time number one is the fact we're living through the coronavirus pandemic. Terrible, terrible suffering by a lot of people all over the globe, including the Jewish people. Terrible time number two, we're living through our exile. And a reminder of that exile begins today with the fast of the 17th of Tammuz, and it will end Be'ezrat Hashem three weeks from today on Tisha B'Av. Today is the day that began the destruction of the Holy Temples, culminated with the actual destruction on three weeks later on Tisha B'Av. Problem is that when we're living through difficult times, do we really feel the greater of the two difficult times, which is really the destruction of the Holy Temple? And if you think about it, the fact that we were unable to go to the shul to Daven, we missed literally millions of our mains and Omenya Heshmei Rabbas and Kedusha. And to be able to pray with the Minyan is true. But you know what that means that we do not have a Beis Amigdosh? It means that we are unable to bring the animal sacrifices that were brought when a person did certain sins and they were able to have forgiveness, a kapara because he brought the animal sacrifices. It also means that we were not witness to the many miracles that took place in the Holy Temple. It also means that in a way, God is homeless, if you will, as the Pasuk says, that build for me a place where I can reside, referring to the Beis Amigdosh. Now God really doesn't have a place to reside. It's true, we have the Western Wall, but it's not the same as having the Holy Temples in Yushalayim near HaKodesh. So on the one hand, we're living through difficult times. Yes, the coronavirus. Lo Aleinu, it is very difficult. And at the same time, we're also living through another very difficult time, which is the destruction of the holy temples. The coronavirus, we all feel. The destruction of the holy temple, we don't feel. And the question is, why not? So there's a story in the Talmud about a Jew and a Gentile walking on the road. The Jew is walking faster. His pace is quicker than the pace by the Gentile. The Gentile would like to catch up to the Jew, so the Gentile tells the Jew, he reminds him of the destruction of the Holy Temple. And although the Jew momentarily pauses and he sighs, but he doesn't stop to walk more slowly to enable the Gentile to catch up. And when the Gentile asks the Jew, but I thought I just told you terrible news. How come you didn't stop dead in your tracks? I thought I'd be able to catch up with you. So the Jew tells the Gentile, it's true you told me terrible news, but you know when a person stops when he hears bad news, that's only when he hears new bad news. You hear something and you go, wow, I don't believe it. You stop dead in your tracks. Old bad news, no, old bad news, people don't stop. It. You see, if it's old bad news, any old news, good or bad, it doesn't grab us, it doesn't pack a wallop. It's not something that we say, you know, something, uh, I feel the news, this is terrible if it's old bad news. It's old, I've heard it before, I'm used to it. We almost become numb to the old bad news. The question is, if we want to be able to merit, to build the Beis HaMikdash again in our day, we have to feel the fact that we're missing the Beis HaMikdash. And if we are numb to it, if it's old news and we don't feel it, how in the world are, are we going to inspire ourselves to rebuild the base of Mikdash in our day? So I believe the answer is with the Medrash. The Medrash brings the story of Rav Gamliel who lived in a certain neighborhood. Rav Gamliel one day was walking and he saw a light on in the house of this woman. And he paused, he waited until it got dark and he started to hear this woman was wailing, she was crying bitter tears. And Ram Gamliel wondered, what is the reason why she's crying such bitter tears? And when he went into the house, 
he asked the woman and the woman said I'm crying because I just lost my only child and from Gamil when he heard that he started to cry with her as well and explains Rav Hutne, even though he did not know this woman and he really could not feel the terrible news that this woman felt by the loss of a child Ramin Gamliel started to cry because he wanted to connect, he wanted to channel his feelings of sorrow and of pain from hearing the bad news, the current bad news that he heard, he wanted to channel that and to transfer that to feel bad for the destruction of the Holy Temple. I believe that's something that we can do as well. It's true that the news of the Churban of the Beis Amigdash, the destruction of the Holy Temple is old. We hear about it every single year. I believe this year we can actually do something to make a difference. Because this year we are all suffering through new bad news. And the new terrible news that we are all suffering is the news of the coronavirus. Similar to this woman who lost her child and was crying bitter tears and Reverend Gamliel channeled his feelings of sorrow to cry together with the woman but he directed his sorrow towards the destruction of the Holy Temple and to feel its loss we can channel the feelings of the sorrow the bad news of the many people that have lost jobs of the many people that have died of the many people that have been unable to share weddings with loved ones and friends with the many people, all of us, that for several months we could not go to the shul to daven with the minyan. We can channel those feelings of sorrow and of pain to the pain and the sorrow of the destruction of the Holy Temple. And I'd like to share with you an idea of how we can do that. You know, people have said that the reason for the coronavirus so we should become better and exactly what should we become better in many people have said we can become better in our emuna, in our belief in our connection with Hashem with the spirituality that Hashem brings down onto the world after all we are all a tzalem elokim we all have an neshama we all have this great great piece of spirituality within us and if we can only connect that spirituality to the spirituality of God's presence in the world, it would be a much better world. We would be better people. People say that the lessons of the coronavirus is we need to strengthen our emuna. Truth is, I don't really understand that. Because the Talmud tells us that the Jewish people are ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim. We are big believers in God. We learn Torah, we do mitzvahs, we give charity, we do tremendous chesed with other people. We take the time to listen to lectures on a fast day to inspire us to become better people, to repent, to get closer to Hashem. Did Hashem have to bring the coronavirus to inspire us to connect to be mechadik, to strengthen our emune. What is it about the coronavirus that is so unique that we needed that specifically to strengthen our emune? So to be able to adequately explain the connection between the coronavirus and the level of emune that really is meaningful, powerful, that can actually bring an end to the coronavirus, I'd like to suggest that there are three rules that Hashem runs His world. There are many other rules that He has, but three that the Talmud tells us. Rule number one, when Hashem brings suffering and punishment to the world, it is not haphazard. There are clues buried into the misfortune, into the suffering. The Gemara, the Talmud tells us, 
When a person is suffering, you fash face by myself. He needs to look into his actions. And the Gemara goes on to elaborate because Hashem punishes Mida connected, Mida measure for measure. You see, the punishments and the afflictions, the suffering are not haphazard. Nothing by mistake. There are no loose ends, it's exact. And every part of the suffering is very meaningful. Which brings us to rule number two. Kolma Shebarak or the Jibahu Ba'olamo, whatever God had created in his world, Loibara Daba Echad Lavatalo. Nothing was created without any purpose. Everything has an address. Everything that happens on this planet is laser like, with a focus and a meaning and a purpose. And even something as big as the coronavirus, affecting billions of people, every single aspect of the coronavirus has an important lesson for us, a message. And rule number three, there are no punishments, no hardships, no difficulty brought onto the world for the Jewish people to take a lesson. That means if there's something happening on the other end of the globe, it's for the Jewish people to take a lesson. And for certain, if there is things happening in the Jewish world, if we too are suffering, and we have, from the coronavirus, there's no doubt we need to take a lesson. I'm reminded of something I once read about Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was a massive painter. Several months ago I read that there's a painting that Leonardo da Vinci painted that sold for $459 million at one of the famous auctions in New York City. Imagine, $459 million. But Leonardo da Vinci was not one-dimensional. He was known as the Renaissance man. He was a tremendous inventor, and when they asked Leonardo da Vinci, what enabled you to make all these wonderful inventions? He said there are three types of people in the world. There's one type, you show him something and he'll get the clue. Show him something, he'll understand and say, yeah, I got it. I can figure this out, I can see that, thank you for pointing it out. And he'll take the lesson, whatever you're showing him. Type of person number two, no matter what you show him, he ain't gonna get it, not gonna happen. It'll go right over him, right by him, right through him. He simply won't get it. And this type of person number three, in which Leonardo da Vinci said about himself, there are some people, even if you don't show them, they will see the lesson. They'll get it. They can find the possible from the impossible. I have a relative who's a massively wealthy individual. He's a billionaire. You know what? You know what enabled him to become a billionaire? He was able to find the money where people said it was impossible. There was no money there. There's no way you're going to make money with that. Somehow he was able to find where the bucks were hidden. He turned something which was impossible to the possibility of a lot of bucks. That Leonardo da Vinci said about himself, I am someone who can turn the impossible to the possible. Well, perhaps we cannot turn the impossible to the possible. But if we point out clues and the clues make sense, then we are being shown the possible and we should be able to see it and recognize it for what it is. So I'd like to share with you two of the many clues about the coronavirus. Remember, whatever God created in this world, nothing nothing is just happenstance coincidence everything has a purpose everything is exact clue number one from the coronavirus a bit bizarre you would think something that has caused so much hardship on the world would be introduced to the world with much noise perhaps a tsunami what about an earthquake can I show you something in a typhoon? How about bombs dropping from rockets all over the world? What about armies invading other countries? Explosions? No, nothing. 
In fact, the coronavirus is invisible. As the President of the United States, when he introduced the epidemic at the beginning of the coronavirus, they counted 44 times in the span of several days, he mentioned this great invisible enemy, the coronavirus. What is it? Can't put my finger on it, literally and figuratively. The experts still can't put their finger on it, and we for sure can't put our finger on it. But we do know one thing. We know that it's real. We know that it's here. And we know it affects everything we do. It affects our work. It affects whether we do go to work, when we go to work, with whom we go to work. It affects whether our children go to school, whether our children were able to go to camp. It affects whether we can get on a plane, whether we can go to the park to play. Can we go to the wedding? Can we go to the funeral? Can we go to the shul to pray? Can we get together with friends? Can we meet a friend in the supermarket? All these are affected by the coronavirus. But one second, how come I can't see it? Because the clue of the lesson is, even though it's something we cannot see, we know it's real. You know what the clue is? God is hidden in this earth. On our world, we cannot see him. He's hidden on the earth, on the planet. And yet God affects everything in the world. We know ain't od milvado. There is none other than God. Hashem affects everything in the world. You know, the Talmud tells us if a person takes out a nickel from his pocket and he wants to take out a quarter, that is called suffering. Because that's meaningful. It's purposeful. It's spiritual. Everything that happens to us happens with a purpose, with a focus, with a meaning. It's laser-like. Everything that he created, everything has an address, has a purpose to it. So you know why the coronavirus is invisible? Perhaps, maybe, it's to teach us the lesson. That just like the coronavirus is invisible and it's real, God cannot be seen, he's also real. Let's go to clue number two. Isn't it strange? that the coronavirus affects every single person, every single place on the planet, rich and poor, young and old, American, European, Asian, Middle Eastern, the North, the South, the East, the West, everyone, everywhere, every time. And we're reminded that we are all affected. Everyone's wearing a mask. Why? Hashem, what's your message? Everyone. So I believe the best way to explain it is with a very fascinating story. It's a story about a secular Jew who is driving a cab in Eretz Yisrael and he meets Rav Chatzko Levenstein, the mashkiach in Europe, who is trying to catch a ride with the cab. He gets into the cab and the cab driver said, I have a remarkable story for you. And here's the story. It seemed that this cab driver was just, just finished his tour of duty in the army with a bunch of buddies. They go to a mountainous region in Africa. They pitch a tent. And one night in the tent, one of their friends are screaming at the top of their lungs and they all wake up and they see, unfortunately, there's a boa constrictor, a poisonous snake around his neck. What do you do? What can you do? You can't throw anything. Maybe the snake will pull even tighter around the neck and kill the friend. Maybe he'll spew his poisonous venom. So one of the people in the tent tells this, Jew, he says, you know, when Jews feel they're about to die, they say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And therefore, you should do the same. And that's exactly what he does. He screams, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And just then, a miracle happens. And the snake slizzes the way. Nobody gets harmed. What a miracle. So this cab driver says to Rav Chatzko Levenstein, he says, you know, my friend, he was so affected, he was so inspired by this great miracle that happened to him. The next morning, he got on a plane, went back to Eretz Yisrael, 
he decided to enroll in a yeshiva. He's been studying Talmud ever since he's become religious. And he remains religious until today. So Rabbi Levenstein looks at this cab driver and says, Nu, and what about you? You witnessed this miracle as well. So the friend says, me? <laughs> Why should I change? This story didn't happen to me. It happened to my friend. He was the one that was saved. It didn't happen to me. I believe that explains why the coronavirus had to happen to everyone. You see, all too often we say, that miracle, that story, no, that didn't happen to me, that's not for me. That's for the person that it happened to. And therefore Hashem is sending us a clue, it's a lesson, strengthen our emuna in Him, everyone. Please, Hashem is begging us, don't say it's not me. And I will give you a reason that you won't be able to say that. I will send a tremendous suffering, the coronavirus, and everyone will be affected everywhere on the planet. No one will be able to say this is not meant for me. This is the lesson of a level of emuna called emuna chushis. It's an experiential emuna. You know, oftentimes we have emuna in Hashem, we believe. But the level of a belief is theoretical. It's in theory. Perhaps it's an intellectual level. We theorize about it. We read about it. We talk about it. We debate about it. But at the end of the day, we don't live our lives with it. The lesson is no. That we need to have a level of amune where we live it, where we feel it, where we experience it. And that lesson was not just for us. The stipler going tells us that was the lesson for Noah. Noah was a tzaddik. The Pasuk says, Esau Elohim is Halech Noah. He followed God. And yet, the Pasuk also tells us that Noah went into the ark when the flood came. If Nehemiah a marble because of the waters of the marble. And the commentator Rashi tells us that the waters of the marble literally had to push Noah into the Teva. Why? And Rashi tells us because Noah was Miktani Yamone. He was a Maimon. He was a believer. He wasn't Maimon. He ain't a Maimon. He wasn't. He wasn't. He was a bit wishy-washy. The stipler go and asks someone like that was wishy-washy. What level of Amunah did he have? And the stipler explains. But the level of emuna that Noah had was an emuna sichlius. It was intellectual belief in God and that God runs the world. But it's not something that he was not 100% convinced and therefore he needed the push of the waters of the mammal to push him into the ark to convince him, yes, look, feel it, it's happening. All too often, we do mitzvot and we learn Torah and we do chesed and give tzedakah and we come to shul to pray but there's an aspect of doubt. The stipler says the lesson of the fact that the water pushed Noah into the ark into the teva was that the best level of emune is the level of emune emune chushis. You know who says the same thing of Yerucham Levavitz. Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz says the following in his Seva Chachma Umusa, Volume 2, Simon 85. Listen to what he says. Says Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz, Madalim, how poor is our Musogenu Be'emune, is our concept of Emune. Adam, a person who oime, he said, Be'kavana with intent and with feeling, the Animamins, after he prays in the morning, Mazik gets Atzmo, he considers himself to be Lamam in Gola for a big believer. Who Maskami agrees that Kol Masha, who Omer, whatever he's saying in the Ikre Emun and the main tenets of Emun is MS. And he says, it would seem that is the Tachlis, the purpose of Emun, but he says, no. How you say the main idea of Emun is that the Amuna should we have is an Amuna Chushis, a sensory experiential Amuna. And he says, Rotsak, Baruch, Baruch, who desires Shalmal Chusa, his kingdom, should be, Tizgala, should be revealed, Dafka, specifically, but Olam Gashmi is there, 
Bechushim Shalanu with our feelings, with our heart, with our emotions. V'zeu ikesh shechina b'tachtoinit. That is the main shechina in this world down here b'tachtoinim. The coronavirus, the lesson that we need to not only improve, to strengthen our amuna, it needs to be a different quality amuna. It needs to be an amuna chushis. And you know, with that amuna chushis, I believe if we take the lesson of amuna from the coronavirus, not only will we be able to end the coronavirus with no more suffering, we will be able to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash in our days. Because the Beis HaMikdash, they saw God was revealed, the presence of God was revealed, there were miracles. Says the Nesiva Shalom, the reason why we do not have the Beis HaMikdash, of course there are certain sins, certain Averot, but at the end of the day we are disconnected from spirituality. We are not connected with God. And that's the reason why we do not merit to have the Beis HaMikdash. I venture to say that if we would elevate our Amuna to be an Amuna Chushis with our heart, with our feeling, with our sense of the experiential, with the certainty as if we're living it, just like Noah was certain he was being pushed into the ark by the waters of the ark, he knew that the flood was coming, the water was there. We too need to elevate our Amuna to Amuna Chushis. And we do so by connecting with the clues, with the hints, with the lessons from the coronavirus. Lesson number one, that even though it's invisible, it affects the whole world. So too, God, which is hidden from our world, he too connects and affects the whole world. And lesson number two, we cannot respond like that secular cab driver who said, I should change and become religious. No, that's my friend. No, that's not so. Everyone is affected. God wants us all to feel that we are all affected and we must all grow in our level of Amun. Very nice that we have a lesson from the coronavirus. But there's one last very important step. We know that David HaMelech, King David, told us in Tehillim, Miyale who will go up Bahar Hashem into the mountain of God was Har Hamoria where the base of English was standing. But Umiyakum Bim Kacha who will stand there, who will remain there. There's no doubt it is important to be Yale to start the journey. But it's more important to be Miyakum when your daughter is going out with that young man that you think is such a nice young man, it's important that she get the date and he get the date with your daughter. That's who, miyale bahar Hashem, but umiyakum, will she get engaged to him? And when your child starts school, it's important that they start on the right foot. But we know umiyakum, we want them to get the degree at the end. And Lahabda, Lahabda, when the sports season, when the professional baseball season starts, all teams are eligible for the World Series because no one has lost any games. That's the Miyale. But the most important thing is who will be at the end? Who will be able to receive the World Series trophy from having won the World Series? Or the Super Bowl trophy where having won the Super Bowl in football? Or the Stanley Cup in hockey? I don't know the name of the jewelry, the ornament that they get in the basketball league. But I can tell you that everybody pines, all the sports players pine for that. It's at the end, umiyakum. So very nice, we're inspired to elevate our level of emunah to a qualitative emunah hushes. But how are we going to remain with that? The answer is that we must take action. Mr. Melio Rab Desla explains in volume 5, page 453, and in volume 3, page 127, that when a person is inspired, don't just remain with the feeling of inspiration. We gotta take action. When Hashem promises Abraham Avinu, I'm gonna give Eretz Israel to your children, 
the first thing Hashem shows his gratitude by bringing a sacrifice to Hashem. He builds an altar to concretize his gratitude. When the Jewish people went to the Beis Amikdash on the holy days and on the holidays, they brought Karbanot. The Pusik tells us they had to concretize their feeling of inspiration and spirituality. A person feels inspired by spirituality. The root of Ruchniyat is Ruach. It's the wind. It blows today and tomorrow you don't feel it. You don't even remember that it was blowing so fiercely the day before. If a person feels an inspiration in spirituality, concretize it, do something. So what should we do? You know what the answer is? The answer is say some Tehillim. And I'm not saying that only because Oli Waba has merited this tremendous undertaking to inspire the Jewish people all over the globe to be able to say Tehillim. I'm here to tell you that Tehillim in times of suffering, in times of calamity, Tehillim is the book of Tzorot. Tehillim is the book of praying to Hashem in times of suffering, in times of tragedy, in times of trouble. Not only that, a week ago on Tuesday morning, Rav Chaim Kanievsky and Rav Gershon Edelstein both recommended in a letter last Tuesday morning that everybody should say some Tehillim every single day. Uli Wabe, it's not only you that is recommending that everybody say Tehillim. Rav Chaim Kanievsky is recommending that everybody say Tehillim. Because Rav Chaim Kanievsky and Rav Gershon Edelstein in their letter, they recognize all too well that through the book of Tehillim, we can end the coronavirus. With the book of Tehillim, we can bring the redemption. With the book of Tehillim, we can rebuild the base Hamikdash. You know how powerful Tehillim is? For Shlomadam and Oyabach. Oshana Rava at night. He would spend hours reciting to Hillam with much feeling and fervor. And not only that, he recommended, he implored all the members of his household to do so. And when people would come to wish him a good Yom Tov, he would reduce the amount of talking he did with them so he can spend more time saying the Holy Tehillim. Throughout the generations, Jews have recited the verses and the chapters of Tehillim daily, weekly, and monthly to enrich themselves with the spirit of the holy words. David HaMelech wrote most of Tehillim, but do you know that Avram Avinu and other Marishoin and Moshe Rabbeinu wrote parts of Tehillim, although the majority was written by King David, by David HaMelech, Tehillim in difficult times, Tehillim, Tehillim has served as our comforter. Tehillim has served as our last line of hope for the Jewish people. The Gemara relates that all the songs and the praises that King David wrote in Tehillim are not only in reference to himself, but with Ruach HaKodesh, with divine inspiration, King David wrote it to help us to help the Jewish people all the way until the end of days in our difficulty, in our sorrow, that it should be a Yeshua salvation for the Jewish people. The Radak explains that King David prayed for all the situations in the future. That's right, King David prayed for us for the coronavirus to end. David Amelov prayed for the healthy, they should not become sick. He prayed for the sick that they should become healed without any more suffering. He, pay, he prayed for the panas of all Jewish people. He prayed that all bad and difficult decrees should be annulled. He prayed that the plagues, that the pandemics should end with no more sorrow. He prayed for all the singles that they should find their soulmate and he prayed 
for all the wives should be able to have their children. The Malbold writes in his introduction to Tehillim, everyone, everyone's pain and sorrow and trials and tribulations, everyone's hardship is embedded in the words of Tehillim and embedded in those holy, powerful, meaningful words of their salvation if we only said it with the Kavanah. Rav Shlomo Zabin Oivach advises, listen to what he writes. He says the smart person will want to familiarize himself to Tehillim so he can so easily arouse him to attach himself to Hashem. Miyala Bahar Hashem, we mentioned, Miyakum Bukam Kotchoy. How do I ensure that I will remain with this inspiration of Amunechuchis, that I feel it in my bones, that I can connect myself to attach myself to Hashem? Let's take the advice of Rosh Hashanah and Oyevach by saying to Hillam every day, Rosh Hashanah finished what he wrote and he said, and I took it upon myself to say to Hillam, to awaken myself constantly through reciting it, to exalt and to elevate my soul and to attach myself to Hashem. There's a story about a Rebetzin who spoke at a Tehillim group that she used to frequent. One day she was going to her Tehillim group and she suddenly remembered it was the yard site of one of her aunts. And at the group she quietly dedicated her recital of her verses of Tehillim for her aunts. Ilunishmas. And wouldn't you know it, that night her aunt came to her in a dream and told her niece, you can't imagine the happiness in heaven for the Tehillim that you said in my merit. You have no idea what your Tehillim did in heavens this evening. We need to know. And Oli Waba, you need to know the Tehillim that you are inspiring the Jewish people, thousands upon thousands of people around the globe to say Tehillim, to end the sorrow of the coronavirus, to end the sorrow of singles, of wives who want children and people who need Panasah, and people who need Shalom Bayis, and people who need help, and for pandemics to build, to end and for the base of Midas to be rebuilt. We can do it. We can do it with the power of Tehillim. For 3,000 years, Tehillim have been the companion of every single Jew at all times. People recite Tehillim and they pray for someone who was sick and in trouble. Many stories of salvation have been recited. But we have to believe in the power of Tehillim. But it's not just Tehillim being said by anyone. Imagine the power of the Tehillim being said by the individual. For certain, the power of St. Tehillim with the group that we, Be'ezus Hashem, will embark on and pass us along to your friends. The power of the Tehillim with the group is far superior. It's like a laser treatment. It doesn't miss its mark. Oshlah HaKodesh writes, if one desires to attach himself to Hashem, he should recite the praises of Tehillim. People often wonder, how can our generation bring the final redemption? We are on such a low level. But the truth is, we can use the fact that our generation's level of spirituality is so low to our advantage and I'd like to explain it very easily you know if you light a match and you walk into a very well lit room the lights the light will go unnoticed nobody will see that the light is being lit and that it's shining but the darker the room the more the match will illuminate the room. I venture to say that our generation, because it is so dark, 
our generation can accomplish remarkable, remarkable feats. And don't take it from me. Take it from the Mikhtar Melio. Listen to what he writes in volume 4, page 108. He begs us, he says, My beloved brothers, I beg you to believe me. It's full of all the books are written about this. The great Sadiqim of the earlier generations, Lahasik to reach, become a Yomim Bakadoshim, it took them many days and months to reach. It is possible for us in one small moment Shoachas to reach that level. You know why? The world who Yosef is shiftless, it's so low. And that is the idea that I mentioned. The Chofetz Chaim said that when Geula will come, we will thank the generation. And even though the generation is a very low generation, we will thank them. The fact that the generation was so bad, it was so low, that elevated anything that we are able to accomplish. And the Mechter Melio continues, V'im and therefore, Rak Nakuda Daka Achas, Nidrashas Imenu. Only a small Nakuda, a small amount is needed from us. And surely, you and I, we are part of the Chabura, of the gathering of B'nai Torah in this dark, low world. But Desla continues, all God is asking from us. The smallest, thinnest, tiniest, needle of the head of the pin of the needle and he says Efsha Lezakos we can merit Ruchni with the wealth of the spirituality awesome that's so powerful Masha'ein Lushaya Meirosh a Putin wouldn't be able to measure if you began to measure it he says he can't imagine how great the unbelievable things we can accomplish unbelievable things we can accomplish. We can retain our level of emunah chushis. We can remain standing. We can, min, we can win that World Series trophy. We can win that Stanley Cup hockey trophy. We can win that Super Bowl football trophy. Lahabdil, lahabdil. We can see that our daughter and our sons get engaged that our children finish school and the coronavirus will end and the base I mean this will be rebuilt we can be the ones to do it because of how low this generation is but we are the B'nai Torah the Chabura the group of B'nai Torah we say in the Sher Hamalos B'Shuv HaSiyan when we return back to you, Shalayim or Akodesh, when the Geula will come, it'll be like a dream. Mr. Melio explains that it'll look like a dream. When we are going through suffering, through tragedies, through anguish, through trouble, and through difficulties, we remember it as being difficult. But you know what's going to happen when the Geula will come? Hayinika Cholmen will look back and will say, the coronavirus? Really? It was really bad. Look, God brought it about. It was necessary. He brought it about. It was necessary to inspire us to reach the level of Amunichushis and to re inspire us again to say the Kapitlach, the verses and the chapters of Tilam every single day. When we come back, to Jerusalem, the holy city, Hayinika Cholman, it will appear as a dream. My tefillah is, then we will merit to bring the Geula and to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash as we start this terrible mourning period of the three weeks. You know, when the people will say, who are the ones who merited to bring the Beis HaMikdash? You know who they'll point to? They'll point to us, we! 
together with all the people who said that the hill and and they will ask what enabled us to bring the Geula and we will say we were inspired by the Tehillim that we said this unbelievable great idea what Oli Waba has to inspire people around the globe to recite a chapter of Tehillim may we merit to bring the Geula and rebuild the base of Midrash in our day Bakara very soon and very speedily Amen I'd like to now end off our class reading Tehillim in an exciting and interactive way that will connect all of us who we are today. Through this exciting app, we will each receive a different parak of Tehillim, allowing us to collectively complete the book of Tehillim in real time, in minutes. And as we've just heard, to help bring the Geula in our day. So please, I ask you to tune in to this short video. Thank you for listening.